Hello. So I'd like to talk about this Julia software framework for quantum control that we've been working on that's available here on GitHub. And there's actually a whole bunch of packages in this framework. But the two that are sort of at the highest level are the quantum propagators.gl package, which simulates quantum dynamics, and then the quantum control.gl, which does the actual quantum control. And that currently has an implementation of Kotov's method and Grape. Uh, so why do we use Julia? So Julia is actually a pretty new language. So it's about 10 years old. And it's it sort of combines the numerical mental model of MATLAB or Fortran with the sort of dynamic workflows that you would have in Python. So compared to Fortran, which we've been using in the past, Julia is giving us a lot of flexibility. And then compared to Python, we really get great numerical performance. So that's kind of the two aspects of what Julia is giving us. OK, so, so let's talk a little bit. What, what do you mean by flexibility? Um, so take this example that we're currently working on. So these are, are atoms trapped in a cosine potential. And um, what you do is you want to you control the movement of these atoms in a circle. Uh, so you want, to, you, you want to sort of accelerate them and decelerate them in sort of a counter-rotating scheme to, to implement an interferometer. So the Hamiltonian looks something like this. And the control that you have is the offset to the theta coordinate. So that's just the, the, rotation, uh, the rotation around the circle. Uh, and that's actually quite different uh, from what you would have normally. So normally, you have Hamiltonians in this form, where you have a drift Hamiltonian, and then you have a control Hamiltonian with some control epsilon of t in front of it. And that kind of structure is usually pretty hard-coded in your optimal control framework. Right? Uh, so now here, we have something where the control isn't just a prefactor, but it's actually a parameter inside of this potential operator. So how does Julia let us deal with this? Well, one of the, the core features is that you can sort of dynamically define custom data structures that are really specific to your problem. And then you redefine any functions, or like loss functions or anything like that, specifically for those data types. OK, so for example, so here we define a data structure uh, that's, that's has, that reflects this uh, kinetic operator and potential operator like we have it here. Uh, so each of these are diagonal operators, and then you can do an FFT to go between the coordinate and put the momentum space representation. Right? So here then is the, um, so, so then we, we kind of just redefine the, the basic linear algebra operation specifically for that data type. Right? So you have the matrix vector multiplication here, and you just, you know, you apply the potential operator, you transform to momentum space, uh, you apply the kinetic operator, and then you go back to a coordinate space. Right? And, and for this component v here, uh, so then you would define, again, a custom data type that encodes specifically this kind of offset control here, and then define another mole function uh, that, would, that would specifically evaluate this line. Right? And I, I just want to stress that this is not part of the quantum control.gl library. So this is just something that's very specific to this particular project. Right? So it's a completely user-defined custom data type. OK, so a totally different aspect of flexibility is that we've designed quantum control GL to be able to optimize really any computable functional. Right? So for example, in the context of quantum information, there's an entanglement measure for quantum gates, which is the, the maximum concurrence that you can get by applying the gate to a separable input state. Right? So, so, so I just give you a two-qubit gate as a, as a, uh, in the logical subspace as a 4 by 4 matrix. And then uh, what you do is you calculate this, this partially rotated gate. Uh, you calculate uh, these values, c1, c2, and, three, and, and c3, from the eigenvalues of this product. And then you look at all the possible combinations of c, c1, c2, and c3 uh, in the sign. And you, you, know, you take the maximum. And this way, you, you, you get this concurrence. And then to make that into a full functional, you also have to take into account that you might lose population from the logical subspace, uh, so you add a unitarity measure here, right? But but this is not analytic, so right. So so as soon as you have something like the eigenvalues, it's not something where you can just write down the gradient of this functional uh, sort of on paper. Uh, so so a few months ago, we developed something called semi-automatic differentiation, where the computer figures out the gradients of really any functional at all, but but in a very specific way that completely eliminates the numerical overhead that you normally have with automatic differentiation, as you basically end up with the same numerical cost in terms of memory and, and also uh, CPU usage as if you had an analytical gradient. 
Um, okay, so how does that how does that actually look in practice? Um, so you can do all of this work in a Jupyter notebook, right? So you you write out your Hamiltonian and Julia code, and you can see that it's it's really written basically straight from like what you would write on paper. Uh, so Julia is really quite expressive in that way. Uh, well, and then you define your functional just like we had it on the previous slide. You define your basis states for the two qubit bases, uh, and then you find these objectives, which is just saying how all of the basis states are supposed to evolve, so they're they're all evolving with the same Hamiltonian. Um, so to put it all together, you define this optimization problem uh, with the objectives. You give it a time grid. Uh, you tell it how many iterations it should do at most, uh, and then this is this is just the functionals. You you have to convert that sort of into the right format, and then this make gate chi. That just that's just the calculation of the gradient. So this is done automatically with uh, automatic differentiation, or rather semi-automatic differentiation. Okay, and then you have a, a convergence check, and and you tell it that it should propagate all the different basis states in parallel. Okay, and then about uh, well, let's see about four seconds later, uh, you get a solution in in thirteen iterations, and that that's all there is to doing uh, this kind of of optimization. Okay, so what about performance? Um, so so let's look at the runtime um, for a, a time evolution using a Chebyshev propagator in a large Hilbert space. Uh, so this is like a, a thousand dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, so we're, we're looking at the runtime for simulating the dynamics of a thousand steps for a Hilbert space of dimension one thousand. So the baseline is the Fortran code that we've been using previously, and actually f with Fortran it actually matters quite a lot which compiler you're using. So if you're using a commercial compiler like iFort with with MKL, you might actually get something like a full factor of two in runtime. Okay. So so, so what about Julia? Um, so we we see that it actually matches the performance. Uh, of Fortran code with iFort, and it's actually even a little bit better. Uh, but then on top of that, there's the flexibility of Julia that you can use just use different data structures, right? So for example, we can just use a GPU data structure that makes this entire time propagation run on the GPU, and you almost get a factor of three in performance. And and I didn't have to rewrite anything for this, right? So I just switched out regular uh, arrays with GPU arrays, and uh, I didn't have to rewrite any any of the propagation code. So it just works out of the box. Similarly, uh, if you want to use sparse matrices for large Hilbert spaces, uh, so we actually have in Fortran we have our own implementation of sparse matrices. Uh, so you got you know you get some kind of runtime. Uh, but if you use the Julia built-in data structures for sparse matrices, it's already Twice as fast, just out of the box. Right. Okay, so so what if you go to to really small Hilbert spaces? Uh, so it actually looks uh, quite similar. So this is for a Hilbert space dimension of ten. Uh, so Julia matches the performance of uh, Fortran with iFort, uh, but then there's a Julia package called Static Arrays, where the compiler knows the size of the arrays and it, it guarantees that the arrays are stack allocated. So this is sort of something very specific to Julia. Uh, and again, you can get an additional factor of two just by switching out the data structure. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, so, so what we get with this Julia framework uh, in terms of flexibility is well, you get the interactive usage, so you can you can do all of your uh, your work in, in Jupyter notebooks. And incidentally, Jupyter. So the Jupyter is Jupyter, Python, and R. So Julia is really quite well supported uh, on on this side. And then you can use custom project-specific data structure, and that's really the key to both the flexibility and, and actually also to the performance is that you can define your own data structures uh, without, you know, having to modify the library as such. Uh, and this allows us to tie into the whole Julia ecosystem. So you can use all the packages for automatic differentiation. You can use all the packages for GPU computing and so forth. Um, and then for performance, well, out of the box, it turns out we actually match Fortran with commercial. So uh, com compilers, uh, and then if we start to use GPUs, we start to use uh, Julia sparse matrices. We start to use static arrays. We actually beat Fortran by at least a factor of two. And to be honest, when we started working with Julia for these, uh, it was actually for these aspects of, of flexibility, and we didn't really expect that we would get quite this performance. But you know, it turns out that's 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 what it is. Okay, so what are the next steps? 
Uh, well, for the propagators, we would like better support for control fields that aren't just piecewise constants, uh, and that would that would allow us to tie into the differential equations such as ecosystem, which has some really state-of-the-art solvers. And then for optimal control, we'd like to have optimizers that can adapt more to experimental constraints. So there would be methods like crab or goat, uh, and then also more machine learning types of methods. OK, so I think I was able to show you some of the advantages of this Julia package. And at this point, we'd really like to have more people using it, or even contributing to the code. Uh, so please reach out if, if you're interested in this. Thank you.